And I was thinking, uh, bless him, he was a spitter when he talked. And uh, he would really get going, he'd be directed to the choir and all that stuff, and you know, some, there'd just be some projectiles. And I thought, you know, of all the things and all the ways God made me, I'm glad I'm not a spitter. Especially in 2020. But I still notice there is like, I, I've got a long range in front of me here. Everybody's scared of the front. Um, hey, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 2 this morning. And we will have our singing and our announcements on the back side of all this. Um, I will say that. I hope you are planning to come out and freeze with us tonight at the band show, and I'll give you some more announcements about that here towards the end. So if, you, if you've been following anything on uh, the, the news, on the internet, uh, we are going to get a Christmas star on December 21st on our winter solstice. That's what they're titling. And we, need to, we need to be very clear about this. They're calling it the Christmas star. But it is Jupiter and Venus aligning. Now, even then, that is skewed because you have to imagine how far apart Jupiter and Venus actually are. Right? When you think about them aligning, you're, I mean, there, there's not any risk of a collision course in their orbit of the sun. And then I want you to think, as you think about that, I want you to think about the things that God used in your life to get your attention that you would believe and trust in Christ. Right? Think about the people God used, the circumstances God used. Think about the circumstances that God is still using in your life to gain and grab your attention. Chances are there's, there's a person involved at some point who spoke a message to you. Um, maybe there was um, some sorrow in your life. I know, uh, you know there's, there's a common testimony of, well, I was just kind of at the end of my rope. I didn't know where else to go, and so I turned to the Lord. Right? None of these things happen by accident. Right? They're, they're by the grace of God and by the leading of God. So here we are in Matthew chapter 2, and we see God leading, and God working. Matthew chapter 2, starting verse 1, says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another. You know, I have had an ongoing feud with my wife for, well, pretty much since we've been married, over uh, this passage of scripture right here. You see, we love nativities. 
Um, I, I, any chance I get, I, I buy one for her. Now we're kind of running out of space and we don't know what to do if I were to accumulate more. Uh, she got one for a, a wedding. I, there's, a, there's a wedding anniversary that's the wood anniversary. Is it the fifth? I don't know. So in our, our anniversary in April, she got a, uh, an olive from Olive Nativity from Bethlehem. And uh, that, that actually went up in April. And so but the, the feud is this. Do the wise men belong at the nativity? And me being the knucklehead that I am have long feuded and say, listen, they don't belong at the manger. And here we see it, right? Here's what we know. Verse 11. And going into the house, they saw the child with his mother, right? And, and so they're not looking for a baby. They're not looking for a little infant. There's a child. This is a picture of the difference between an infant and a toddler. And here's what I've said. I've sat eight percent out of the room for this. Who cares? Why have I made this such a big deal? And ultimately, here's what God has done. And here's what our Bible is showing us. Matthew wants to tell the story of the birth of Jesus through the lens of the wise men, through the lens of the Gentiles. And so, right, the question they're asking is, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Right, so it, it, it starts with his birth and it continues on for however long it is. We, we know from, as we'll see in a couple weeks, from birth to about the age of two is what we're looking for in the person of Jesus at this point. So who are the magi? Who are the wise men? Well, they are not from Egypt, as some people propose. They are not from the Orient, uh, as some people propose, right? Where do they come from? They come from the East. And, and so just like anything, we're going to look at Scripture, we're going to look at what is clear or what is obvious, and then we're going to dive down to use what is clear to find out what we kind of don't know, right? So here's what we know about the wise men. They are likely astrologers and astronomers, right? So you know the difference? Astronomy is the study of the stars, their positioning. Right? Their, their life cycle, right? Of looking at them and, and even looking at constellations. Astrology is looking at the stars and trying to predict the future. What mood I'm going to be in this month. What fortunes I will or won't have this year. Right? And so there are two very different things. But within the wise men, I think you would have seen both. Right? And so, so where did they come from? Here's what I would speculate with. I'm going to turn to Daniel chapter 2 real fast. Daniel chapter 2, which, if you'll remember, is where we left off in Daniel. Right? So you remember that the king had a dream. And he wanted an interpretation, and he wanted a group to tell him his dream. Who was that group? Daniel 2, verse 27. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. Now the king, uh, we're going to see other translations are going to use both of these terms and they're going to call them the magi. Well, what is magi? Well, that's just kind of short for magician, right? But really, we, just, we decide for this as the wise men, and this is precisely what they are. They are these astrologers. They, they are these astronomers. Um, and, and you see it in Daniel 2, verse 2, the king commanded the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans. Uh, and then you see it as well in verse 24, right? Uh, and so we, we get this idea of the wise men of Babylon and the wise men here. Because there's, there's 
there's a couple things that are happening. One is they're traveling from the east. Well, what is east of Jerusalem? Babylon. But not even that is where did they get the idea that Jesus or the Messiah or this king was going to be born anyways? Well, God sent the people of Israel with scripture into exile hundreds of years prior to this, right? And so it set them on a journey all the way back looking for this king, looking for a star. And in fact, um, as we'll see, this group are one of the reasons we know about things like the Christmas star we'll observe this year. So who are they? Right? They're likely wise men. And this is, listen, the best theory. Right? This group of wise men that has continued on in this tradition from the, the land of Persia, right? Modern day Iran is where we're looking at, but really Babylon. Well, and what are they looking at? Right? We have seen his star when it rose. I want you to understand the specifics of what they're saying. They didn't say, we saw a star. We saw the star. They clearly call out and they say, we saw his star. And so listen, there's theories on this as well. One of the very first theories is it's a comet. Right? You, because this star moves. Um, stars don't move. But comets do. And so maybe it was a comet. Well, not likely. And, and I'll explain why. This year, as I said, right, we have this alignment of planets. Well, there's, there's a strong theory, and it's actually a pretty good one, if you, if you want to look into it, that there was an alignment of actually three planets at this time. Uh, that Jupiter, Venus, uh, excuse me, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars aligned. There's other theories that it was Jupiter and Venus, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, there's a theory that it was a supernova, right, the, the formation but here's what you need to understand. So we know that, so there's a Christmas star this year. It's uh, Jupiter and Venus. That exact same thing happened around 800 BC. How do we know that? Because everybody got their phones out and they took pictures of it on Facebook. And it was amazing. No, we know that the, the same alignment of the stars, excuse me, of the planets happened around 800 because the Babylonians documented it on clay tablets. You need to understand that the Babylonians had observatories and they were, we, we tend to think that much of what we know about astronomy comes from around the Middle Ages, right? When people start really building and developing uh, much better telescopes and you get Copernicus who has this audacious theory that everything is rotating around the sun instead of everything is rotating around the earth. Turns out he's right. Well, no, no, no. Babylonians were thinking these thoughts almost 2,000 years before them. That is how advanced they were. They were watching the stars, partly because they wanted to learn the stars, because they wanted to predict the future. They wanted to know what was going on, just like Nebuchadnezzar wanted to know what was going on. Right? Just like all the kings and the rulers around the time of Babylon. No, they thought by looking into the stars, they could see these things. And so understand, they would not have been fooled by a comet. Right? They know what a comet is. They documented what a comet was. They knew the difference between a star and a planet. Right? So they're looking for something very specific. And here's the thing. Right? Stars and planets just don't move as it is described here. Right? We don't know exactly what it is, but here's what you need to understand. It was a supernatural sighting, not a natural sighting. Right? It's not what we're going to see on December 21st. Because verse 2, right? What do they say? Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose. Well, that's different. Well, stars don't act in that manner. It continues, 
right? Verse 9, what happens to the star now? After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star they had seen, when it rose again, it went before them. Okay, so now the star is like, kind of like moving along, and it's going and sitting before them. And then it says, and then it rested over the place where the child was. I mean, these things don't happen every day, and these things don't happen on the rotation of a calendar, right? And so, I, I don't, listen, I don't want to spoil the fun of December 21st this year. Um, but we're, we're not seeing exactly what the wise men saw. Um, but there's good news even in what we get to see, as I'll explain here in a bit, right? And so we know who, we see who, some of what the wise men are. We see a supernatural sighting, but you need to understand that someone was sharing the gospel with the Gentiles hundreds of years before the arrival of Christ. Because they had this idea, they were waiting and they were reading the Hebrew scriptures and going, you know, there's something to this, right? That they were putting their faith in the Messiah, even though they're Gentiles. And this is what Matthew is doing here. Right? Matthew doesn't tell the Christmas story the way Luke does, right? When Quirinius was governor, right? It's so fun to say, right? No, he's telling it in a different way. Though Matthew has a very direct audience towards the Jews, he's wanting them to see and understand. Don't miss the boat because the gospel is already coming to the Gentiles. And, and, and you think the gospel is just now coming to the Gentiles because you're reading the book of Acts? Matthew's saying the gospel came to the Gentiles when Daniel arrived. And God was proclaiming his might and name then. And so what were they looking into? Numbers 24, verse 17. In Numbers 24, there is a, again, we're talking about the Gentiles. The, the pagans, there's a pagan prophet, and he makes what is called an oracle, but really it's a, it's a prophecy that many believe this is what the wise men were looking to. Numbers 24, verse 17. I see him now, but not now. Right? I see him now, but not now. What does that mean? There's a day coming. I see it. I behold him, but not near. Okay, so there's a day coming in the distant future. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and it shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Shem. Right? So it's looking at the present, right? Is it they're in this land? Listen. There's a day of judgment and reckoning coming for you. But there's also a star that is going to arise. So guess what? The Babylonians are constantly searching the skies. And then one day they see a star arise. They see something they've never seen before. And they go, huh, this sounds like something I've heard before. Do you remember that guy that interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar? Do you remember how he brought and taught the Hebrew scriptures to us? And maybe it wasn't Daniel. But they had to hear somehow. And somebody brought the gospel to them. And you think, listen, Pastor, that's not very much to go on. A star in Jacob. Right? That something's going to rise in the land of Israel in the distant future. Well, actually, I would say they had more to go on than that. And we'll see as we go through the book of Daniel that God gave them a calendar. Right? God gave them a calendar to count down the arrival of the Messiah. Remember how we looked at the statue? And then there are four kingdoms, and then they're going to be crushed? Again, God gave them a calendar. So they have a little bit more to go on. But I also want you to understand one of the beautiful things about the gospel that we believe. Chances are when you gave your life to Christ, or maybe you're on the fence with that, you didn't have a 100% perfect understanding of the gospel, right? You had probably never done an in-depth study of the book of Romans, right? Maybe you've never really done anything inductive with Galatians, 
right? You, 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 you probably were acquainted with the gospel stories, but you probably didn't know, man, the ins and outs. You may not even be able to explain how to give your life to Jesus to somebody else, but you just knew you needed to do that. Right? And, but you acted in faith because there are essential things that we need to understand the gospel, even though there are so, so much deeper things. That's what the wise men are doing. They traveled based upon what they knew. Even though they didn't know everything, they honestly didn't even know where to go. Right? They, they took a wrong turn at Albuquerque, to quote Bugs Bunny. Right? But they expressed their faith and they went anyways. They eagerly followed the star. And understand, in our modern mindset, they saw a star when it rose, so they got in their minivan, because that's what caravans drive, dr travel in, and they went. No, no, this is not a one-day journey. This is not a one-week journey. This would have taken them at least a month, which again works well for, man, this is a supernatural sighting of this star. You know what's not easy? Traveling through the desert. Traveling with a large group of people, right? Because we're not talking about three people. We just, we just kind of deduce and assume that there are three gifts, so there's three people. No. No, they would have traveled with an entourage. They, they, they made a scene. Understand that when they showed up to town and they said the words they said, Herod freaked out. Herod freaked out everybody in Jerusalem freaked out, right? Three people aren't going to cause commotion, but an entourage will, right? A, a large caravan will. So they acted in faith on what this is, that God fulfills what he promises, that his prophecy always comes true. Listen, God still keeps his word, and so for them, the journey was worth it. Church, for us, the journey is worth it. That God is working and leading and moving. And the further they went on this journey, the more their faith grew and the more faith they gave over to the Messiah. But I also want you to understand they weren't seeking a star per se. Right? They, they honestly, I, I've really been wrestling with this as I studied is what did they actually know that they were seeking? They came and they said, where is he who has been born? King of the Jews. We're searching for the king of the Jews. But they also say they want to worship. Now, worshiping a king would have been very common in their culture. It would not have been common or acceptable in Jewish culture. But they came and they found something greater. Right? They were seeking not just a star. They were seeking the one who made the stars and set them in motion in Genesis. Church, I, I say this because there is always a natural bent of curiosity. It sells books. It gains audiences. It gets a platform. When we start looking to things like stars... When we start trying to read and interpret the signs that may or may not be legit around us. And so it will, it will get you on the bestseller list time and time again. But understand that these wise men were not seeking after a star. They were seeking after somebody and something greater than the stars. Listen, I, I think I said a couple weeks ago, astrology, right, is the pseudoscience that we can interpret the times, we can interpret events and predict the future through looking at the stars. It's a 1.3 billion with a B dollar in industry annually. And here's the thing, Christians are just as inclined to pursue after astrology as non-Christians. Because we're curious, let's be honest, we wanna know. We, we, we think maybe we can get a leg up. Maybe this will help me with my business deal. Maybe this will help me with my family. 
Maybe this will help me plan out my things. No, no, no. We are not seeking after the creation. We're seeking after the creator. Right? We seek after him through his word. Right? We seek after truth that is unchanging. Promises that are fulfilled. And because of that, we worship. Right? Just as, listen, the wise men went, they didn't go on a hunch. They traveled because of a star, but a word came to them before that star ever appeared. Church, we need to have a likewise faith that we see in the word what is true, and his word directs us. How often times have you said something like this to God? God, if I just had a sign, or if you would just make it more clear, Listen, there, there's nothing more clear than his word. His word is always true. His word never fails. He never lies to us. He never misleads us. God never sits up and, and like he's looking at the wise men and going, oh, those suckers ended up in Jerusalem. <laughs> no. God is orchestrating all of these things and leading all of these things for his glory and so that the gospel can go out, not just to the Jews, but to everyone. That is what we see here. That is the importance of this passage. But I want you to see, and this is how all of us worship. This is how they worshiped. They worshiped what was revealed to them. God used a star. He revealed it to them. They went in faith. God used the word, right? We looked at Numbers 24, but that's not the only word. Right? God used Micah 5.2 right, to show where is he going to be born? Bethlehem. Right? And then they see the child himself and they worship. We can only worship based upon what God has revealed to us. Period. That's exactly what worship is. Worship is our response based upon how he has revealed himself. That's always what it is. That's honestly one of the reasons I, I thoroughly enjoy. In fact, I, I hate the fact that we only do two songs and kind of have an abbreviated song set. But I've long thought that we kind of reverse the way we do our liturgy of worship. Because we worship based upon what is revealed, right? Is, and so our music is the response from what God has shown us. Right? So we open the word, he reveals, we respond. Right? We do it on a Sunday morning. Listen, you do it in your quiet time with the Lord. He reveals, we respond. That is how it always goes in scripture. That is still how it works today. Right? Moses sees God revealed in a burning bush. God says, hey, kick off your flip-flops. This isn't just any place. Right? God reveals with fire. God reveals with clouds. God reveals with stars. He is doing all these things, and what is the response? Listen, you don't just encounter God and say, eh, that was neat. There's always a response, and, and not everybody responds the same way. Herod absolutely rejected and opposed what was brought up. And, and, and here's... And, and, and that's disturbing enough, but what was more disturbing was who told everyone where, the, where Jesus was going to be born? It's the people that knew the scripture. It's the scribes. And even the scribes said, oh, a star rose. That's neat. They would have known. They would have known Numbers 24. They would have thoughts of this. And, and, and they knew the scripture. They didn't have to go and consult. They didn't have to go to their concordance. They said, oh, that's easy. I can find two. Give us something hard, king. But then they just sat there. They sat there. The most advanced team of astronomers shows up in your country, and you say, eh, no big deal. And so here's how God has revealed himself. And it's the same way he does today. One way God has revealed himself is through creation. Right? 
is through creation. Now, you, you think about this for a second. Through light. Where does our light come from? Stars. Stars. It's pretty amazing. And God reveals himself in this way that there's a light to govern the day and a light to govern the night. Man, I, I, so in creation, God has designed and made everything in such a unique way that our bodies have abilities that are like the stuff of comic books. And, and, and there's probably some people in here who's like, well, I, I'd like a little bit more of that stuff of comic books. You guys have been so faithful to pray for, for, for our daughter Grace. So her arm isn't setting just perfect. But here's what's happening. God has wired this in so that it will continue to grow more straight, heal itself. The bone where it broke will be stronger than it was before in that place. And then over time, it will decay and eat away at where there's some sharp pieces that are kind of irregular and wrong. And I didn't get to go to the appointment, but I instantly go... At that point, do you not just ask the, the nurse, whoever's practicing, go, do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? Now, certainly, we're in a broken, fallen world where our bodies are, accept, are susceptible to things like viruses, broken bones, ailing sight. But we see right here, in the creation, God revealing himself. Right? We see even in this story that they have precious metals. Right? They have perfumes and incense. But then there's this star. It is God who started the event and put the searchlight out there. Listen, God is still working and using creation as a means to reveal himself. Romans tells us that all men are without excuse because he has revealed himself through his what? Through his creation. And so he reveals, we respond. But that doesn't stop there. God is revealed in creation, but God is revealed mostly through his revelation, through scripture. Right? We've looked at Numbers 24, 17, right? That a star is going to rise. We've looked at, Ma at Micah, excuse me, 5 2, that in Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by no means least, for from, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. But then there's Isaiah. Listen to what Isaiah, how God reveals himself in this instance of the Magi. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. That is what the star is. It is the glory of the Lord. We'll know more fully someday, but it ultimately is the glory of the Lord. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. Who is going to see the glory? Nations shall come to your light. Where, where are the magi from? Where are the wise men from? They're not from Israel, right? They're from pagan nations. And the kings to the brightness of your rising, lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar. And your daughters shall be carried on the hip. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and exult because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. They came bearing gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, I know you know that gold has value. But you probably don't trade frankincense and myrrh at your home as a commodity. But understand, these were highly valued, precious things at the time. And then it continues, right? Wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. And young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. And they shall bring gold and frankincense. And shall bring good news. The praises of the Lord. So God reveals himself in creation. But always understand. 
If we want to know who God is, what God has done, and what God will do, we find it in his word. We find it in his word. The same word that these magi were placing faith in, that the God who had written these things, is the same God we are serving and moving towards. And so the revelation of God, we respond to. There, so there's creation, there's revelation, and then there is what is so glorious, the incarnation. The incarnation. This time of Christmas where God put on flesh. He came as a babe, right? And so they responded to the creation. They responded to the revelation, but they worshipped at the incarnation. They worshipped God himself. They worshipped the babe. Who is Jesus called? We call him by many names. It's Christmas. We call him Prince of Peace. We call him Emmanuel. We even call him Everlasting Father. But in Revelation, Revelation calls him the bright and morning star. He's being revealed to us, and we worship. Listen, we are able to seek because the author of life, the author of all things, has written himself into the story. C.S. Lewis once said, One could no more meet God than Hamlet or Romeo or Juliet or Lady Macbeth could meet Shakespeare. All right? So think about this for a second. So you have these characters within Shakespearean plays. They don't know who Shakespeare is, but only it would be a fool to think that there is no author. But how to know the author? How would you know the author unless they meant purpose and they wrote he or she into their own story? And so, in a more modern way, Luke Skywalker could no more know, know George Lucas than if he had written himself into the story. Harry Potter could no more know J.K. Rowling unless written into the story. Or, since it is C.S. Lewis, Prince Caspian could no more know who C.S. Lewis is other than the author to be written into the story. There is an author from around 1900. Her name is Dorothy Sayers. And Dorothy Sayers was, she was just, man, she was just ahead of her time. Dorothy Sayers was one of the first women to ever graduate from Oxford in England. She was actually a contemporary and friend of C.S. Lewis. And, and another thing about Dorothy Sayers is she, she, she did what women were not doing at the time, like graduating from Oxford, but she was writing detective stories. In fact, I think she wrote a series of about uh, 13 books all with the central character of, this is so fun to say, Lord Peter Whimsey. That's just so fun. I mean, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to name your dog, but I'm, I'm setting you up right there. I mean, come on, you, you get yourself a little cropper dog, Lord Peter Whimsey, the neighbors are going to think you're so fancy. So Dorothy Sears, she's writing all these novels, and about halfway through, she writes in a new character. This new character falls in love with Lord Peter Lindsay. This new character's name is Harriet Vane. And Harriet Vane becomes the person that rescues Lord Peter because he was kind of lost. He was an aimless man. He kind of went about from thing to thing, and, and he just didn't have a love and a hunger within him. But then, halfway into this story, Harriet Bank comes and is described that she rescued him. And you need to understand that Lord Peter Whimsey, I mean, just by the name you already knew, he is a catch. Central character, he's got it going on. He's everything. Well, here's what you need to know about Harriet Vane, this character. Harriet Vane was a mystery writer. Harriet Vane graduated from Oxford University, who falls in love with the main character and rescues him. Dorothy Sayers wrote herself in to the story. 
Some people speculate it's because she just loved the character of Peter Lindsay so much that she wanted to fancy herself having a, a love so wonderful and having such a, a romance. Whatever reason, it doesn't matter. It doesn't take a lot of speculation to figure out who Harriet Vane is. This is what makes Christmas amazing, church. Jesus wrote himself into the story. He wrote himself into the story because he saw people all the way from Genesis 3 who were rebels, who wanted nothing but their own way, who were aimless and hungry and hopeless and broken, oh, so broken and needy. They were fighting constantly. They had no peace. They had no joy. And so at just the right time, in just the right way, there had been a foreshadowing. There had been this building that the love story was growing. And we would get glimpses of the author here and there. They would look up to the stars and they would say, oh, what a glorious God. He would lead them in a way unlike all the other nations around them. He would speak to them. But then, then at just the right time, God wrote himself into the story. This is what makes Christmas absolutely amazing. Is that Jesus wrote himself into the story because he loved us. Because he wanted to bring us the peace that is impossible apart from him. He wanted to do as Dorothy Sayers did with her character, Harry of Anne. He wanted to rescue us. And that is exactly it. We, listen, think for a second. If Jesus had not written himself into the story, who would you be? Where would you be? What would your life be like? Here's just a few things. Your life would be hopeless. The Bible describes our life apart from Jesus as we're dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. We're dead. You're broken. Broken people, like company, broken people tend to break and hurt other people. Jesus came to fix, to mend, to heal. We would be foolish apart from Christ. Chasing after our own whimsies and thoughts, our own fancies all the day long. How selfish, apart from Christ, we would be. And, and here's what we would be doing. The wise men were chasing after a glory. You and I, we are chasing after some sort of glory. Maybe we get that glory through the accolades of others, through praise. Maybe we get that glory through having a little bit more money in our pocket. Maybe we get that glory through having people underneath us and having the authority to tell people things. We are chasing after glory. As the wise men were chasing after a glory. And so Jesus came and he was that greater glory. You and I need to surrender and pursue. It's the only solution for our sin. Not just our sin, but for all sin. That is precisely why Jesus wrote himself in. Think about it. If Jesus hadn't written himself into the story, we would still be trying to gain acceptance with God. Which apart from the Messiah, is impossible. Apart from the Chosen One, we can't do it. John 1.14 says it this way. And the Word became flesh and, you remember it, boys? Dwelt among us. That's the easy part. The next part says this. And we have seen His glory. As of the only Son sent from the Father, full of grace and truth. We worship what has been revealed to us. What has been revealed to us is the glory of creation, the glory of Scripture, and the glory of the incarnation, the glory of Christ himself. That's what makes Christmas amazing and magical, full of joy, that even I want to burst out and sing. Just do it quietly and under my mask when I'm at Walmart. But that's not the only way God reveals himself. 
There's one more way that rhymes with creation, revelation, and incarnation that God is revealing right here and now, and it's the regeneration. The regeneration. What do I mean? Is that you and I, we've come, we've been presented with these revealed truths about God. We've come to know the Messiah. We've come to know Jesus. And listen, we don't leave the same. He changes us. Right? Scripture calls us and says we are a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. That we are regenerated. We are made new in Christ. You don't think that speaks a word out into the world? Scripture says it speaks a word out into the world. Right? Matthew 5, verse 14. Right? That we shine out in this dark world. Um, Philippians. Philippians 2. Verse 14 says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning. Parents, that's a free one. Verse 15, That you may be blameless and innocent children of God, listen to this, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Do you think we're in the midst of a, cro a crooked and twisted generation? Here's what the regenerate, changed church does in the midst of a generation. Among whom you shine as light or as stars. In the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ... I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. When we live for Christ, we are giving a revelation out of this world. Now, it's not the only revelation, but it is a revelation. is that we are revealing Christ to the world with our words, with our actions, with our sacrifice. Is that there is something greater than the glory of man. It's the glory of God. And the glory of God changes people. All people. Even wise men. Right? It's really not fair that we call them wise men. Because I think we think, oh, they were such smart fellas. You know, they, they knew how to get to God. No, they only went because God revealed it to them. They had nowhere to go and nothing to do. God didn't have to put all the stars in the sky that we don't even know anything about yet. But he's named them. He knows them. But he did. And so we study them, and what do we look for? The glory of the one who did it. And so, in creation, in the revelation, in the incarnation, and in regeneration, Understand that God is leading you. God is leading people around you. This is such a great season to invite somebody to church. This is such a great season to open up and share the gospel with somebody. And I, I mean the gospel, not, not like some uh, little, little, little quip that we share, right? It's that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and Christmas is when that Savior came and wrote himself in. And he regenerates sinners, the foremost of whom. Right? That's the good news. That's the good news. So God is listening, leading. Are you listening? Are you obeying? Are you following through on what you've told God you were going to do or what God's already told you through his revelation, through his scripture? I look back and I, I see some of the calendars and some of the plans that I made at the start of this year, and I just chuckle. But that doesn't mean there aren't still things to follow through on. And that we don't have a gospel and a God to still be faithful to. And a message that is still going out all the way from creation until today. And so, where are you at? Right? Do you need to give your life to the Lord? Right? Do you need to just find a way to celebrate the incarnation in your home or in your community, in your circle of friends? 
right? You need to brush up on your Dorothy Sayers with your friends that like to read so that you can tell them about Jesus. Right? Listen, here, here's what's so interesting. National and global media right now, who doesn't care at all about Jesus? Let's be honest. They're making much right now of two planets that are coming into alignment. And they're even using words like Christmas star. Do you ever feel like God may be just lobbing up a softball for you to swing with your family member that you've been hoping to share the gospel with? Your coworker, your friend, your neighbor? Yeah. I think he is. Because sometimes, man, it's lobbed so soft. And sometimes that softball is more like a beach ball. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's pray. And then we're going to respond as what's been revealed. Jesus, thank you so much. It, it, it truly is amazing that you came to us, that you, you came as a babe, that you experienced the suffering, you experienced the hurt, that you experienced the death of loved ones in flesh. You experienced temptations and overcame. You obeyed the Father perfectly. You held true to the Word always. So Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. Jesus, be big. God, I pray for those that don't know you. I pray that they'd come to know you. They would, they would quit fighting against you. Jesus, I pray that we would be bold. We would shine as stars in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Because of who you are and the glory that you have been in our life. Jesus, thank you. Amen. Will you stand and sing?